brothers and sisters. First of all, I want to thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for coming to this conference. Uh, this conference was just a series of miracles um, that are, are all a result of dreams. And I very much hope that you find something meaningful and lasting uh, that emerges from, from this meeting in Radford. There are many, many people who helped me in organizing this conference, and I'll be writing to all of them to express my gratitude. At this time, I would like to thank three people in particular who helped to make all this happen. First, Dr. Glenn Martin, who one year ago offered to have Radford University host this conference. Glenn? Can you just say hi? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because if he had not made that offer, I don't know if we would be sitting here today. Uh, second is Clark Webb. Um, Cl Clark, can you say hi too? <laughs> Uh, Clark has worked tirelessly to spread the word of this conference all over Virginia and the surrounding states. And I believe he has himself great faith in the goals of this conference. And finally, I need to thank Dr. Gary Corsari. Gary, can you say hi, please? Hello. Uh, for the past one whole year, has provided unbounded moral support for this project and also worked very hard to bring on board some of the great speakers you'll be hearing in the next three days. So thank you all very much for your moral support. Before I go further, I'd like to call Leonard McGann to the stage here. Um, he's going to play something beautiful for us, which I feel will serve to set the mood of the conference. First off, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be standing here in front of such a group of people who have gathered together for this purpose. Now, if you would mind, would you mind uh, joining with me in an opening prayer? I don't pray to one particular God. I pray to all gods. And I just ask the Creator to help each person as they're here this weekend to come with open hearts and open minds so that they may be filled with your goodness, O Creator, and go back home and do the things of which needs to be done in order for the, this process to keep going and growing. So thank you with that. Another thing I would like to do, in the native tradition, we burn sage. The sage runs away the bad spirits. At this time, I'd like to do that, too, because in the, in the beginnings of this conference, we need to ch chase away all that of which we need not in our lives. And this buzzard feather that I will use to spread the smudge with, the buzzard is a representation of the cleansing of the earth. It takes away that which we no longer need in our lives also. So with the running away of the bad spirits and taking away of the carnage that which we no longer need, Please, O oh Creator, take away that and needs not be in our lives. Help us to walk with the goodness of which you have intended for all of us to have. So thank you, O oh Creator. Thank you so much that we are standing here today and we are all gathered together in such a wonderful gathering. Thank you, O oh Creator. Now this song I have picked out is a song of which we'll start out with turmoil. We'll start out with chaos. But as you listen, as the song progresses, you'll hear that it goes to a single voice. And this is the single voice of all the speakers that will be here this weekend. But then after you hear the single voice, then you will hear it smooth, the music smooth out and turn into something of which is no longer chaos, and no longer turmoil. And I'm hoping that this conference this weekend will in, invoke this upon people. <laughs> Thank you. 
next thing I'd like to do uh, is to call, request all Iraq veterans to come to the stage, please. Boy, does that look great. All the way up here, please. No, no, no. Adam. 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 Can you please come up here? America has one military force that serves the interests of a handful of very wealthy elite men. We have here, right here, another military force that serves the interests of the people of America. They represent the genuine wishes of the American people. They risk their lives first in Iraq and today they continue to risk their lives by speaking out against illegal, immoral U.S. wars. Most human beings do not want war. But in every country, immoral leaders compel their military to engage in war. These men here, can everybody see them please? These men here have understood that it is simply a crime to invade other countries and slaughter the beautiful people living there. So I want to salute these men. I want to pay my respects to them. And I ask that all of you now, please stand up and give them a hand. Thank you all for that and, and for GARDA for war organizing this wonderful event and for including us in this. Um, my name is Adam Kokesh. I served as a sergeant on a Marine Corps Civil Affairs team in, uh, from Fallujah to February, September 2004. I now serve on the board of directors of Iraq Veterans Against the War. And uh, I'm really excited about what we're doing here tomorrow. We're going to be doing a speak out, give you guys a little bit of an idea uh, of our personal backgrounds, of our stories, what led us to the point where we, we were able to have uh, the blessing of the freedom of mind to look back upon our experiences and come to the point where we are now where we were at least ready to join an organization organization such as Veterans for Peace or Iraq Veterans Against the War. And uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun tomorrow morning from 11, that's from our first session, 11 to 12.45. And then the second session we're doing uh, on Saturday from 2 to 4 is a truth and recruiting workshop. We're going to start getting brown, get, uh, down to brass tacks give you guys some, some skills that you can really apply, and uh, just one more way to be a part of the struggle. So thanks. It's an honor to have you all here. Uh, some of you may have heard of Dr. Michael Hudson. Uh, he, as some of you know, he's the... Uh, how do you turn on the mic? Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to convey greetings from Dr. Michael Hudson. Uh, some of you may know he's the financial advisor to the Kucinich Congressional Campaign. And he has asked me to convey some very good news, which is that this week Congressman Kucinich is presenting legislation in the House requesting that the mm -hmm. because, uh, as some of you know, the IMF has been one of the most exploitative institutions in the world. Um, however, just last week, Turkey paid off its debt, and right now IMF has no clients. It's a defunct organization. So this is a great milestone 
on the road to economic justice. Uh, I want to say that if we define evolution as gradual change and revolution as accelerated change, I would like to express that we need a revolution in this country and in the world. There is too much suffering everywhere. We cannot remain silent. We also, however, cannot feel helpless or hopeless. We must become very bold in our minds and our actions. We must take personal responsibility for the crimes of the military industrial complex. You have seen by now, uh, some of you, the Declaration of Independence uh, in your tote bags. Um, it's, it's a declaration of independence from the present U.S. government because of its crimes. Our dream in writing this document is to inspire every community, every town in America to write their own declaration of independence from politicians who commit crimes against humanity and who murder in our name. Congressmen and senators who vote to deny health care to millions are criminals. Michael Moore calls them murderers. Senators and congressmen who fund the slaughter of our brothers and sisters in Iraq and Afghanistan are criminals. And senators and congressmen who deny Americans adequate purchasing power are also criminals. Senators and congressmen who refuse to stop the speculators who today are causing a global food crisis are also criminals. So what I feel is we need a revolution in this country. And I'm not referring to a violent revolution. I'm referring to a nonviolent political, economic, and cultural revolution. But more importantly, we need a moral and spiritual revolution so that we can have a chance to once again be considered civilized by our brothers and sisters around the world. The major panel sessions at this conference represent what we consider to be the most critical issues facing our nation. Sunday morning, we're having a collective brainstorming. And I hope that every one of you will participate, every one of you sitting here. Um, I want to hear each one of your voices. We want to discuss, then, how to take our country in a better direction, a more noble direction. So there are a few, few mistakes in the room numbers. Uh, when you leave today, uh, when you leave tonight, please pick up the, uh, the, the addendum. They're, they're, they're going to be passing them out of the door. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to my co-organizer, Gary Corsari. Hello, can you hear me? Is we just back there? Is this one on? Hello? Hello? How's that? <clears throat> what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, Or does it 
explode. Langston Hughes was 49 when he published that poem back in the true man era. He'd seen some ups and he'd seen a lot of downs. Born soon after the war to end all wars. Growing up mulatto in the crime roaring 20s and the soul deep depression. He'd seen the labor movement crushed by hired corporate guns and goons and government of the mighty for the mighty, saved by the traitor to his class, who was no traitor to his class. He'd seen another war to end all wars and the holocausts of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Dachau, and the beginning of a Cold War that was no Cold War. And he'd seen a people put their dreams on hold, a Negro people, an American people, and the poor and powerless and disenfranchised all over the world, war weary, war devastated, hard laboring, peace craving, hungry, disenchanted, confused by the cascading changes, searching, questioning, truth seeking light in their leaders and holding fast to their dreams, the old dreams of peace equality of opportunity, equality before the law, a new deal, a fair deal, the dream of the promise of technology to eradicate poverty, to expand human horizons to the zenith of our understanding, the dream of social progress in our families, our communities, our shared humanity. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? We are nearly three generations removed from the publication of Hughes' poem. We've had some ups and we've had a lot more downs. We've seen the best minds of our generation destroyed by madness, as Allen Ginsberg put it the madness of materialism, owning things, possessing things, caressing things in a world of shrinking resources, peak oil, water shortages, food riots. We've seen the promise of technology pollute our rivers, our lakes, even the fathomless seas and the air we and our children breathe. We've been confused by the cascading changes, future shocked by the rate of change, the unbearable lightness of our being, and we wonder where to stand and how to hold on to this fiercely spinning globe. <clears throat> and we hold fast to the old dreams of honor and even noblesse oblige, and we hold fast to the new dreams of democracy, freedom, and fair play. We seek the light of truth in our leaders. We petition, we vote, because we hold to our dreams. And we have been told, we have been taught, we have been trained, this is the way. We are peace craving, we do not want conflict. The average man and woman eschews conflict. We petition, we march, we shout, not in our name, not in our name, not in our name. And our leader smirks, he chuckles, his shoulders shake. Isn't freedom wonderful, he says. And the bombing begins, and the Holocaust continues, six years now. One million dead, millions more wounded, raped, crippled, torn, physically, mentally, spiritually. Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. 
or does it explode? We gather here tonight and over the next few days to ponder Langston Hughes' question, to share the burden of our dreams, to challenge our dreams. Have they been beacons or have they misled us? The American dream that Henry Miller back in the 1920s called an air-conditioned nightmare, where is it taking our world? This shrinking, wounded globe we share with hungry billions? What healing vision can we offer? We who traveled first into the future, where did we stumble? Where did we lose our way? And can we help each other now? Can we put aside the territoriality of ideas, the preciousness of ideology, and find a thread out of the maze? These are mythic times, and we have been like the explorer, Jason, wandering through the labyrinth, lost in a hall of mirrors, in which we have had to confront ourselves, our worst fears, and ultimately the child-devouring demon, that half-beast, half-man, minotaur, monster that looks a little bit bears an uncanny resemblance to Dick Cheney. <clears throat> but is really much more than Dick Cheney. Is really the consummation of our dreams distorted. Dreams of comfort and ease and endless expansion on other people's lands using other people's resources. And now, even as we confront the beast, we ponder the way back. And we, we remember that the root of the word revolution is volvere, to turn, with the prefix re, back. And so we wonder how to get back to first best principles, the best thoughts of our spiritual leaders. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others, follow the golden mean. And we hold in our hands the secret of the way back, not a rope, not a cord or spool of thread as the mythological Jason, but a chain. Every single link forged with understanding, courage, creativity, and action. Let us listen to and inspire each other. We have many sharp analysts on the left, acute minds trained in dialectic, wonderful writers and thinkers who can present well-honed arguments, people armed with information, facts, and figures, and we have humanists who see the bigger picture we know how corporatism and militarism impact communities and we can buttress the story with charts and trajectories and we must study these things if we don't want to study war no more. But sometimes we lose sight of the importance of the artist in conveying the message, the dreamer who frames the yearning combining the best of what we think and what we feel. I've asked some of the best activist artists I know to come to Radford to perform, to share their work, to inspire with their words and music. I've been very fortunate in being able to assemble a rich, eclectic brew. I hope you'll join us as we explore new sounds, new ideas, new visions, new dreams. I hope we can explode some old myths and lay the foundation for some deeper truths. Truths we have wrestled the angel to find. The chiseled truths of intellect. The perdurable truths of the heart.
I'm Clark Webb, and I live in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, just down the road, oh, about 30 minutes. Uh, when I was talking with uh, Garda, and we were uh, planning uh, our, our, our publicity and our, and our uh, outreach efforts to bring people uh, here to Radford, I wondered out loud to her, why Radford? Well, the answer is that Radford is a jewel in the crown of the mountains that we know of as Appalachia. In amongst the beauty of these mountains, uh, the beautiful New River, which I hope you have a, have a chance to see and, and maybe, maybe walk alongside if, if you take a break uh, uh, during lunch, there's a, there's a magnificent biological diversity. There's birds, there's, there's, there's flowers, there's so many beautiful plants. Uh, maybe you'll get a chance to see uh, the deer running through the fields. Uh, there's bear, there, there's raccoon. Uh, every, every, every animal that you grew up learning about uh, that, were, that were native to these forests is, is right here, right in, the, right in the vicinity of Radford. But in, in amongst the beauty, there's a history of, of exploitation. There's a history of environmental degradation. There's a history of conflict. We have Civil War uh, battles that were fought. Uh, just a 15 or 20 minute drive from here. More recently, we have the tragic episode at Virginia Tech where a severely unbalanced young man in seven minutes shot 55 people. And before he turned the gun on himself, 32 of those 55 were killed. I was thinking, coming over to the conference today, what does that say about our time? That technology that can kill so many can be in the hands of one deranged individual. And, and I realized that that is so much a metaphor for our time. We have leaders now in this country. They have the technology of surveillance. They have the technology of, of uh, weapons. They have so much that science has given them. And I'm sorry to say, but they're deranged also. Uh, ju just earlier today in the reception, which, which is wonderful, I, I want to encourage everyone to, to talk to the people around you. You don't need an introduction. You know, you can just reach out and say, I'm, I'm so-and-so, I'm, 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 I'm here and, and you're here. Let, let's talk and, 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 and find out what passion we share for justice. What passion do we share for changing our world? Some people even say revolution. What passion do we have? What, what passion do we share? Uh, just one quick uh, uh, episode this afternoon. I spoke with um, Luis Bosch and Kathy Garger about depleted uranium. Uh, they're, they're, they're having a workshop uh, sometime. It's, it's in your schedule. And I was just blown away by the impact of these weapons. That these weapons have been put in the hands of our military, and, and soon, I would guess, other militaries. This is the derangement of technology. So, and, and that's just one example. There are so many that I could, I could go on and on. The, the schedule is loaded with, with inspiring, incredibly moving stories of, of people who are engaged in, in heroic issues of our time. So if you see a workshop and it sounds good, go to it, because it is going to be good. And just one last thing I'd like to say. I, I want to thank each and every one of you for being in the office, uh, in, in the auditorium today. Uh, some have come from long distances. I met a man who traveled all the way from India to be here. We have 
other people from, from uh, Africa uh, and from Europe um, and South America who are going to be a part of our gathering. But however long you've traveled to get here, some people only, like myself, 30 minutes down the road, you're here on a journey, not just of miles, not just of, of time, but a journey of your life. Just, just think back one minute, just one minute here. Think back to maybe your first time when you encountered an issue of injustice. Maybe it, it was an act that was perpetrated on you or a member of your family. Maybe it was something that you observed in your neighborhood or, or your town or, or your city. At some point, you saw someone take a stand and said, no, this is not right. And you did something about it. And that journey that you began by saying no to injustice and saying yes to what is right, that's what's brought you here today. And I honor and respect each and every one of you who is on this journey, and we're all in it together. So let's celebrate being here. Let's sing. Let's dance. Let's speak from our heart, and let's really connect with one another. Because the conference is what you make it to be in your connections with other people. So thank you for being here. And I turn the podium over to my good friend, Glenn Martin. My name is Glenn Martin, and I teach here at Radford University. Uh, I'm the chairperson of the Peace Studies program, and it's really not me, but the Peace Studies program that is hosting this conference. Uh, and you may, many of you know, uh, we've had several Peace Studies faculty who have been picking you up at the local park and ride so that you can come from the airport and so on. <laughs> And I want to appreciate them. Uh, one of them is Sid Smith over here. Raise your hand, Sid. Uh, thank you, Sid. And is Bill Kaverick here? Is Bill in the audience? And Kristen Morrison was our third person. Uh, so any of us, including me, if you need anything, I want to be your host here. I want this to really work. As Clark said, I really want us to have a, a great conference and a great connection here. So see me if you have a problem. Uh, this document that we have in our uh, packet, I think it's a wonderful document. I wasn't one of the authors of it, but I read it and I was deeply moved by it. It talks about revolution, right? And uh, as Garda mentioned in her opening remarks, I think that is really on the agenda. We have to think in terms of revolution. Now, this document speaks of revolution as accelerated change, which I think is correct. But I think revolution also means questioning the fundamental assumptions transforming the fundamental assumptions of a society, of a way of living, of thinking, and of institutions. Uh, we live in a world order structured by a duality of fundamental assumptions, the first of, it, first of which is global capitalism, unrestrained, uh, unrestrained energy used for the private profit of a few at the expense of the rest of us in the world. The second assumption, most fundamental, I think, in this world, is the assumption of the sovereign nation state, militarized and armed to the teeth in competition with every other nation state and uh, uh, serving as a kind of fortress in which you can't get in or out of it very easily without a visa, without proper identification, without uh, them watching you every moment. We live in a world, as one prominent website calls it, which is a prison planet. 
And that's why I want to say that revolution means questioning those assumptions. Those assumptions of global economics and the global system of militarized sovereign nation states have led to a massive world of structural violence. Structural violence means 50% of the people on this planet live on less than two US dollars a day. They are in hell. I've seen them, I've been to many of their countries and so on, and this system, a product of the global economic system and its assumptions is kept in place by the militarized system of nation states which arm their oppressors, which arm their dictators, which train their militaries, which send its own military in imperialist wars and so on. These are the assumptions of this world and they're inherently violent, inherently destructive. So when we speak of revolution, which I think we should in this conference, and we, I think we should be thinking in those terms, questioning the fundamental assumptions, not only of this nation, but our world order. When we think of revolution, it is not, if we're really thinking in terms of different assumptions, it is not violent. Violence sucks us into the old assumptions, the assumptions that force and power can be used in one way or another, to create the world in the interest of the few at the expense of the many. Nonviolence is inherently revolutionary, and I think we should think in those terms, and we should think in global terms. Uh, this wonderful doc Declaration of Independence talks about our fundamental humanity and our solidarity with the entire planet, with every person on the planet. I think that is the beginning of rethinking the structure of the world. Global capitalism does not think in those terms at all, and the global nation state system does not think in those terms at all. So I want to welcome you all to Radford University. Let's make this conference happen. defense attorney who has worked for many decades in the state of New York. I was living outside the country uh, most of my life, so I did not hear, uh, I did not know about all the earlier great work that she did, Her great and, and that she still does. Her great work consists of defending the people whom no one else wants to defend, whom the mainstream media always vilifies and persecutes. And, and how many people can you find anywhere in the world who run to the, to the people who are leperized by everyone else and who pick them up and, and, you know, I mean, figuratively put them on their laps and take care of them and, and bring them back, bring them back to society. Uh, I, I don't know how to express my appreciation for Lynn Stewart. Lynn, please come in and speak to us. <laughs> 